Coming from Montana, I kind of like listening to country music occasionally. Some members of my family believe there are only two types of music, country and western. The other day I was cruising home from work and a country song, song from Keith Urban came on. It was called Saying Something. Basically, the song reminds there is strength in our words and, and encourages us to say something. Now, that song helped motivate me as a public health guy that it's time to say something about mental health. My interest in mental health as a public health issue began many years ago while growing up in a law enforcement family. My late father retired as captain in the Oregon State Police, and throughout his career, he responded to untold numbers of situations related to mental health issues, including substance abuse disorders. Even off-duty, it was tough to get away from it. While maybe not best practice, I remember times as a kid in the back seat of the family station wagon, being in hot pursuit of drivers under the influence. Experiences like these caused me to later wonder about the root causes of mental health issues. I tried my hand at law enforcement, but it was short-lived. My 6'2", 150-pound frame didn't quite match my father's 6'4", 250-pound frame. Did I say 250? I was 150 pounds. So I chose to come to BYU after a mission, pursue my goals as a student athlete, and study psychology. Now, getting a job with an undergraduate degree in psychology, that was a bit tougher. Still having athletic eligibility to compete another year after graduation, I consulted with beloved BYU mentor and track coach Cheryl James, who at the time was also teaching classes in the Department of Health Science. As a consummate builder and lifter of people, he encouraged me to combine my interest in psychology with a master's degree in health science while using my last year of athletic eligibility. Well, the rest is history. I worked through a master's program, completed a mental health-related thesis, published my first academic paper on mind-body health, and went on for a PhD. Thank you, Coach James. My purpose today is to encourage us all to say something, know something more about mental health in order that we all might be something more and obtain optimal mental health. To say something about mental health, we need to first say something about mental illness. The terms mental illness and mental health are often used interchangeably. Mental illness, also known as a mental disorder, refers to any condition that includes cognitive and emotional disturbances, abnormal behaviors, and or impaired functioning. Unlike physical illnesses such as diabetes and cancer, there is no medical test for mental illnesses. Trained mental health professionals use the Diagnostic Statistical Manual or the International Classification of Diseases to make a diagnosis. These tools provide various symptoms that, if experienced over time, indicate a mental disorder. Having open conversations about mental illness can help us reduce the stigma or negative perceptions of individuals who struggle with mental illness. People with mental illness are not alone. Epidemiological data from public health shows that one in five individuals, adults age 18 or older in the U.S., report having a mental illness, with over one in 20 reporting it was serious enough to disrupt major life events. Three-fourths of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by the age of 24, making the traditional college years a particularly vulnerable time. Among college students in the U.S., mental illness is getting worse, with the symptoms of depression increasing 135% over the last nine years. Major depression, one of the most common mental disorders in the U.S., is highest amongst young adults age 18 to 25. Similarly, symptoms of anxiety increased 110% amongst U.S. college students. Are BYU students immune from these disorders? National data on young adult major depression closely aligns with the burden of disease amongst BYU students. According to research conducted on campus by my colleagues and I, one out of five students reported experiencing clinical depression, with nearly one out of three experiencing moderately severe or severe anxiety. Now, individuals living with mental illness need treatment services. However, over half of adults in the U.S. and half of Utahns with mental illnesses receive no treatment. There are likely two reasons for this. 
One, a lack of access to mental health care due to lack of insurance, fewer provider options, and the cost of care. And two, a personal choice not to utilize the services because of the stigma related to obtaining treatment. Much is still to be done to increase access and reduce stigma so that seeking treatment for these disorders is as normal as seeking treatment for physical health conditions such as diabetes. However, we tend to unfairly link violence with mental illness. While it's estimated that one in every five police calls involves some type of mental health or substance abuse crisis, we must be careful not to contribute to the stigma, as most violent crime in this country is not committed by someone with a mental illness. Now, while suicide itself is not a mental disorder, mental disorders are one of the most important causes of suicide. A total of 60% of individuals who die by suicide have a mental illness, such as major depression. Utah averages 657 suicides a year and has the sixth highest suicide rate in the U.S. Think about that for a minute. I recently flew on a regional passenger jet that held 75 people. The number of people that die from suicide each year in Utah is equivalent to nearly nine of those planes crashing every year in the state. That would make headlines. For Utah, suicide is the leading cause of death for adolescents and young adults. For college students, suicidal ideation has increased 64% since 2013. For those in suicidal crisis or emotional distress, help is immediately available through several incredible resources. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, as of July 16th of this year, can be accessed 24-7 in every U.S. state by dialing or texting 988. Additionally, the state of Utah offers the Safe UT app, which provides real-time crisis intervention for students, parents and guardians, and educators right on a smartphone through a live chat and confidential tip line. BYU Counseling and Psychological Services, or CAPS, offers some of the best psychological services in the country with over 32 full-time counselors who stand ready to assist students in crisis with no appointment needed. You can walk in during business hours or reach a trained professional after hours. We all can be part of the solution to suicide by becoming QPR trained. Offered on campus through CAPS, this hour-long best practice training helps you know what to look for and, who, and how to help someone who, that is struggling. Now, mental illness is not the same thing as mental health. Mental health is a state of well-being where individuals realize their own unique abilities, cope with everyday stress, establish constructive relationships, work productively, and contribute to the community. It is a state of well-being with the focus on positive human development and becoming our best self. For Aristotle and the ancient Greeks, a state of well-being was referred to as wisdom and was rooted in the idea of eudaimonia, or living life well and consistent with one's values. Contemporary psychologists discuss well-being or optimal mental health slightly different depending on their perspectives. Humanistic psychologists such as, for example, Abraham Maslow referred to this state of well-being as self-actualization. From the positive psychology perspective, well-being or optimal mental health was first referred to by researcher Corey Keeves in 2002 as flourishing. Flourishing is the notion that individuals achieve high, higher levels of well-being by focusing not only on eudaimonic components, such as developing meaning, purpose, and strong relationships in life, but also hedonic components, such as experiencing positive emotions. Flourishing is a state of optimal mental health, and according to Keyes, quote, people that flourish not only feel good, but also do good. They experience positive emotions regularly, excel in their daily lives, and continue the world around them in constructive ways, end quote. One thing interesting about Keyes' research is that he noticed that many individuals who were not flourishing lacked a mental health diagnosis. He called this state of poor mental well-being without a mental illness diagnosis languishing and learned these individuals tended to lack a sense of purpose, struggle to enjoy life's simple pleasures, and be positive about life. 
they tended to experience a general feeling of, well, blah. These findings helped to change our paradigm that mental health was simply the opposite of mental illness. It's not. Mental health is not simply the opposite of mental illness. He helped us realize that mental health exists on its own continuum, and we can flourish and achieve optimal mental health or languish whether we have been diagnosed with a mental disorder or not. I'd like to repeat that. We can, re we can achieve optimal mental health and flourish whether we have been diagnosed with a mental disorder or not. This should be empowering to all of us. The idea of languishing may sound a bit familiar and could explain your personal experience with the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, we were exposed to endless sources of information and misinformation, which tended to heighten our anxieties. The WHO referred to this phenomenon as an infodemic. In addition, our regular routines were impacted as we were socially distanced, isolated from each other, quarantined, for forced into online learning, lost jobs or time at work, and even mourned for those who died from the virus. Over time, the cumulative effects of the pandemic may have left you feeling emotionally fatigued and, let's face it, not as mentally well or just feeling blah. Why should we worry about languishing? because individuals who languish are significantly more likely to develop mental illness. Now, saying something isn't enough, always enough. From the public health perspective, knowing something more about the root causes of mental health challenges is critical to developing solutions and achieving optimal mental health. One thing to know at the outset is that mental illnesses are not the result of sin. During his ministry, the Savior was asked by his disciples about the affliction of a particular blind man. They asked, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The Savior responded, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. It is a mistake to equate mental illness with sin. Indeed, the root cause, causes of mental health challenges, whether mental illness or languishing, are complex. In their 2015 study, Wittenborn and colleagues reviewed the literature on the root causes of major depression and used a systems thinking perspective to illustrate the complex interaction between biological, environmental, behavioral, and social factors that contribute to the illness. Their causal loop diagram looked like this, and while small and a bit messy, speaks to the complexity of mental health challenges. To make sense of the complexity, root causes for mental health challenges, when identified through research, are often organized into risk and protective factor frameworks, which are then used by practitioners to address the challenges. Risk factors are those things that increase the likelihood of an individual experiencing the problem. Protective factors are those things that mitigate the risk and are often simply the opposite of the risk factor. For example, if having, a few friend, having few friends is a risk factor, then having good peer relationships is protective. Furthermore, risk and protective factors are organized across ecological levels. This is because our thoughts, our attitudes, our feelings, and our behaviors are influenced by the environments in which we associate. Ecological levels in which individuals are nested include peer groups, families, institutions such as school and work, and communities. Some of the more common risk and protective factor frameworks have been developed by organizations such as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, and the American Mental Wellness Association. You can check those out. Today, I'd like to highlight a few of these risk factors based on work my colleagues and I have done here at BYU. These include having a perfectionistic attitude, experiencing life stressors, having poor coping skills, having adverse childhood experiences, and bullying. One particular risk factor of concern for college students, especially students here at BYU, is having a perfectionistic attitude. Perfectionism is refusing to accept any standard less than flawless. Using the multidimensional perfectionism scale, we asked BYU students how they felt about statements like, if someone does a task at school better than me, then I feel like I failed 
at the whole task. And a fewer, the fewer mistakes I make, the more people will like me. And other people seem to accept lower standards for themselves than I do. With 40 being the highest possible score on perfectionism using this scale, our findings revealed that the average score for BYU students was 27. Additionally, we found a significant correlation between perfectionism scores and mental health outcomes. For example, a perfectionism score of a 30 was associated with symptoms of clinical depression and clinical anxiety among students. Notice in this slide, depression and anxiety increase as perfectionism scores increase. An additional risk factor associated with mental health challenges is our exposures to stressors at each ecological level and our ability to deal with those stressors. Stress, as defined many years ago by Hans Selye, is the nonspecific response of the body to demands made upon it. Stressors describe those demands that trigger an automatic physiological fight or flight response, which feels like someone just stepped on your internal gas pedal. Because our bodies strive for balance, or homeostasis, a part of our nervous system acts as a brake pedal when the threat subsides to bring our body systems back to normal. However, what happens when exposures to stressors continue over time? Or maybe even worse, when we anticipate and worry about stressors even when there is no immediate danger? Robert Sapolsky, author of Why, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, noted, quote, when we consider ourselves and our human propensity to worry ourselves sick, we have to expand our notions of stressors merely being things that knock us out of homeostatic balance, end quote. The stressors we face are significantly different than zebras, and not only explain why we get ulcers, but many other physical as well as mental disorders. A growing body of research is demonstrating the powerful relationship between chronic stressors and their ability to disrupt the immune system, causing inflammation throughout the body that leads to cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, and even depression. Chronic stressors include poverty, neighborhood violence, or environmental changes, as well as just plain daily hassles. Stressors can also involve early life stressors, such as adverse, adverse childhood experiences or trauma. While a certain level of stress can be beneficial and enhance immune function and improve performance, the accumulation of chronic stressors and traumatic life events cause wear and tear on the body and the mind and is what researchers refer to as allostatic load. My colleagues and I asked BYU students what stressful life events they had been exposed to during the past year. The options ranged from more serious stressors, such as death of a parent or a close friend, to more daily hassles, such as getting a speeding ticket. More serious stressors were weighted higher than daily hassles in our analysis. For BYU students, the most common stressors were an increase in workload at school, change in social relationships, and a change in eating habits. Interestingly, BYU students with the highest number of stressful life events were freshmen, married students, and students in committed relationships. These groups of students may need a little extra support in managing stressors. Like our findings with perfectionism, the more stressful life events students were exposed to was associated with more clinical depression and anxiety symptoms. Notice in this slide, depression and anxiety increases as stressful life events scores increase. We've also studied the impact of early life experiences on mental health outcomes amongst college students. Our results showed that the more adverse childhood experiences or ACEs college students are exposed to, the more likely they are to have difficulties coping with stress, be languishing, and experience depression and anxiety symptoms. ACEs include childhood exposure in the home to abuse, neglect, neglect, and or household challenges like substance abuse, mental illness, suicidal thoughts and behavior, divorce, incarceration, and domestic violence. Being exposed to these stressors as a child impacts our mental health and even our physical health later in life. As a result, we should do all in our power to prevent childhood exposure to trauma. 
These are the things that Elder, Elder Patrick Kieran spoke about in the last general conference, noting, quote, there is no place for any kind of abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, or verbal, verbal in any home, any country, or any culture, end quote. Now, if you are now worrying about the aces in your own life, there is more to this story. In our study, we also found that students exposed to more positive childhood experiences, or PCEs, were protected against depression and anxiety symptoms later in life, even when having exposed, been exposed to ACEs. We demonstrated that PCEs lead to an increased ability to cope with stressors, increased flourishing, and ultimately strong mental health. Positive childhood experiences include such things as having one good childhood friend, having good neighbors, enjoying school, having regular family meals, and having beliefs that give comfort. Our study adds to the literature, a growing body of literature, that ACEs can weaken our ability to cope as college students. PCEs can increase resilience, promote flourishing, and ultimately reduce symptoms of mental illness. Through the multidisciplinary computational health science research lab here at BYU, my colleagues and I recently explored the impact of hundreds of possible risk factors on adolescent mental health. Using a machine learning approach to analyze the risk factor data of some 179,000 high school students across Utah, across all ecological levels, we were able to predict with 91% accuracy suicidal thought and behavior amongst this adolescent population. Our findings revealed that the most highly associated risk factors with suicidal thought and behavior were, one, being threatened or harassed through social media, two, being bullied on school grounds, three, be, being in a family that has serious arguments, four, being in a family that argues over and over, and five, being in a family that insults and yells a lot. Additional interesting findings included the fact that suicidal thought and behavior increased with age, was more common among females, and was 73% more likely if there was not a father in the home. The major findings of this study not only speak to the incredible negative impact that our relationships can have on mental health, but also the potential impact for positive relationships to be protective. Our findings from these studies and others are contributing to this growing body of literature on the many risk and protective factors related to mental health. Much of this work points to the powerful influence of context and our interaction with others in settings like home, school, and communities. Saying something and knowing something about mental health isn't always enough either. To achieve optimal mental health, be our best self, and flourish, we must be something as well. Because many of the risk and protective factors associated with mental health are addressed by living a wellness lifestyle in an environmental context that supports wellness, I invite us all to be something more by being wellness-wise personally and institutionally. Being wellness-wise is an idea that was hatched here at BYU and means that we recognize wellness is a personal opportunity as well as an institutional responsibility. It also means we recognize that wellness is embedded in the very fabric of the mission of this institution. From the mission statement, you might recall that BYU exists to assist individuals in their quest for perfection and eternal life with the expectation that all instruction, programs, and services at BYU, including a wide variety of extracurricular experiences, should make their own contribution toward the balanced development of the total person. In order that such a broadly prepared individual will not only be capable of meeting personal challenge and change, but will also bring strength to others in the task of home and family life, social relationships, civic duty, and service to mankind. If we look at it closely, which we will, our mission statement makes wellness and thus optimal mental health everyone's business. Dr. Barbara Lockhart and Dr. Ron Hager from the BYU Department of Exercise Science have defined wellness as, quote, a dynamic state of our being characterized 
by the balance and integration of our whole physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and social self, end quote. There are many other definitions of wellness too, but they essentially speak to the personal act of pursuit of a balanced lifestyle. This is what makes wellness a personal or whole person opportunity. The ideas of an active pursuit and balance are referenced in two parts of the BYU mission, mission statement, the quest for perfection and eternal life and the balanced development of the total person. Now, when considering the quest for perfection and eternal life, I know that sometimes the word perfection can freak us out a bit. We learned today that many students on campus are focused too much on perfection, which is associated with greater mental health challenges. Rather than focusing on achieving perfection in the here and now, being wellness-wise means we will focus on the quest for perfection and eternal life rather than on perfection. The quest, the pursuit, the journey towards perfection is about striving and growing to be our best possible selves. It's knowing that during this quest, we are going to experience challenges, setbacks, and possibly even failure on occasion, no matter how righteous we think we are or how perfectly we live the gospel. President Worthen has said, quote, failing is an essential part of the mortal phase of our quest for perfection. We don't often think of it that way, but that is only because we tend to focus too much on the word perfection and not enough on the word quest when we read the mission statement. Failure is an inevitable part of the quest. In our quest for perfection, how we respond when we fail will ultimately determine how well we well succeed. End quote. Now, being a runner, I love the recent success story of freshman Sebastian Fernandez, who came to BYU last fall after having some success as a middle distance runner in high school. He tried out for the track team in hopes of being a walk-on, but ultimately didn't make the team. Sebastian didn't let failure derail his goals. He continued to train with the so-called farm team, a group of other BYU track and field student athletes who weren't quite ready for the competition team. Sebastian commented that, quote, having that experience of failure helped me realize that nothing is going to be given to me. I have to work hard and earn everything, end quote. By focusing on the quest and having a never give up attitude in the face of failure, Sebastian not only made the team this past spring, but also broke the all-time facility record at the Robinson Track and Field Complex by running a one minute, 47 second, for 800 meters. That mark marked ranked fifth on the all-time list here at BYU, propelling him into the regional meet where he ultimately qualified for nationals. Did I mention that Sebastian was a freshman and didn't make the team last fall as a walk-on? Sebastian is a great example of one who stayed focused on the quest. Now let's consider that statement in the mission the balanced development of the total person. This refers to the even distribution of our efforts to grow in each of the areas that make up the total person. Several years ago, I was on my way into work and I lost one of those balancing weights on the vehicle, on the, on the wheel of my vehicle. It made for a very bumpy ride into work that day. Similarly, if we neglect or exaggerate any of the important domain areas that make us whole and well, we will personally be out of balance and our ride through life will be bumpier. Some of the areas that make up the total person should be familiar to you as they are the foundation of the children and youth program in the church and based on the scripture, and Jesus increased in wisdom stature, and in favor with God and man. Surely these important areas of intellectual, physical, spiritual, and social growth should be pursued throughout our lives and not just during our youth. Being wellness-wise as individuals means we continue striving for balance and growth and development in these important areas throughout our lives. Now, because they're very important to college student wellness, being wellness-wise at BYU also involves two additional areas of consideration, the emotional and the financial. These wellness-wise domain areas are not mutually exclusive and overlap as important parts of the total or, total or whole person. 
But viewing and discussing them separately provides a way for each of us to evaluate how balanced we are and where we might need to improve. Let's consider each of these six important domain areas and what BYU Wellness Wise pros recommend. First, spiritual. Spiritual wellness means we believe in Heavenly Father, connect with Him, and align our life in ways that bring us closer to Him. Dr. Justin Dyer, BYU professor of religious education and Wellness Wise Pro, reminds us that the Lord has said in Psalms 46 to be still and know that I am God and that the Lord of hosts is with us. Dr. Dyer's pro tips for spiritual wellness include, first, to believe God loves you and can lift you higher. Dr. Dyer encourages you to remember that God loves you throughout your struggles and will help you take steps forward. Second, find moments and methods to feel God's love. Because our busy schedules tend to push us away from quiet moments, Dr. Dyer notes that quiet moments are essential for us to feel connected with God. If you're struggling to feel the connection, try something new, like searching the scriptures and the words of the prophets for ways that allow you to better feel God's love. Third, dive into your religious community in order that you can love God and your neighbor, as well as receive and give much needed support. Dr. Dyer pleads that if you are struggling to connect in your ward, Don't give up. Seek ways to uplift others in your ward, for your unique gifts are needed. Social. Social wellness means we establish positive relationships with others. Having a strong social support system is important for emotional wellness, as it it helps us cope with and bounce back from challenges. Angela Bloomquist, director of the Student Connection and Leadership Center here at BYU and Wellness Wise Pro, notes that we are all social by nature. Her pro tips for social wellness include, first, creating lasting connections by participating in events, activities, and programs in the campus community. She notes that volunteering is also a great way to have a higher sense of purpose, increase social skills, and increase self-esteem. Second, foster belonging by embracing diversity and ensuring equity and practicing inclusion. Angela promises that as you do so, hearts and minds are enriched. Third, cultivate communication skills to become a better friend, student, employee, and leader. This may require less digital communication and more face-to-face conversation where effective communication and active listening can be practiced. Physical wellness. Physical wellness means we balance sleep, physical activity, and nutrition, and practice safe behaviors. Nathan Ormsby, director of the BYU Student Wellness and Wellness Wise Pro, loves the quote by President Ezra Taft Benson that, with good health, all other activities in life are greatly enhanced. Nathan's pro tips for physical wellness include, first, exercising routinely, because the benefits of exercise are indisputable. He says the key to sticking to a routine is simply finding an activity that you like to do. Second, prioritize sleep as your body craves a regular routine when it comes to sleep. Striving for eight hours of sleep a night is a good goal, but staying up until 3 a.m. and sleeping until noon will leave the body unprepared for bed by 10 p.m. the next night. Routine sleep is necessary for mental functioning and mental health. Third, eat well. Like sleep, the body likes consistency, and regularly eating healthy foods such as vegetables, fruits, lean meats, and whole grains can help support brain function, body function, and mental health. Intellectual wellness means we expand our knowledge, skills, and creative activities. Dr. Chip Oscarson, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education and Wellness Wise Pro, believes that the more we learn, the more we see the connection between the sacred and the secular. Dr. Oscarson's pro tips for intellectual wellness include, first, to be curious, but don't limit education by memorizing facts and solely focusing on a profession or material gain. Curiosity is the active part of our learning that demands our agency. Second, Dr. Oscarson recommends that we be a good listener and humbly without judgment because truth may be more expansive than what we previously imagined. 
Third, ask good questions, because this can help you understand truth in more than one dimension. Fourth, Dr. Oscarson recommends you discern with the Spirit, as the Spirit is given to help us stay balanced and understand how all truth fits together. Financial, financial wellness means we properly manage our monetary assets. Failure to manage these assets can be a large source of stress. Paul Cronrad, manager of the BYU Financial Fitness Center and Wellness Wise Pro, has warned that sustained financial distress may cause us to feel anxious, helpless, and vulnerable. Learning to wisely manage our financial resources creates feelings of confidence and peace. Paul's pro tips for financial wellness include, first, consider your blessings, because we can make ourselves miserable when comparing our, li comparing our lives with others. Considering blessings can help you avoid feelings of envy, jealousy, and bitterness that lead to discouragement and hopelessness. Second, Paul recommends find a budgeting method that works for you. Using time while at the university to test, adopt, or refine a budgeting method will help you be more intentional and confident in your spending. Third, find ways to meet your needs less expensively by aligning your spending with your values and goals. Doing so will help you gain a greater sense of purpose and control. Fourth, plan for the unexpected, because even small unexpected problems can be disruptive and stressful. Planning can help you avoid the added stress and possibly using an expensive credit card option. Now, finally, emotional wellness. Emotional wellness means we cope with both positive and negative emotions while learning and growing from emotional experiences. Dr. Clint Hobbs, counselor in CAPS and Wellness Wise Pro, reminds that emotions are interwoven with every aspect of wellness, and managing our emotions effectively enables us to be healthy, kind, and compassionate. His pro tips for emotional wellness include, first, being compassionate with yourself. Seeing yourself as a work in progress and not feeling threatened when you don't do as well as you wanted to do in school or other activities. He reminds you need to give yourself the same grace you would give to a good friend who might be struggling. Second, he recommends that we avoid avoiding difficult tasks or things that make you anxious. For example, you may have a tendency to avoid stuff by binge-watching episodes of your favorite TV series. Avoiding may work temporarily, but leaning into whatever is making you anxious can actually cause anxiety to go away. Third, connect with others. Your social well-being, this social well-being skill can reduce mental health challenges and improve self-esteem. Sacrificing social time, even for academics, puts mental health at risk. That's good news, isn't it? Fourth, Dr. Hobbs reiterates the importance of seeking balance and not going to extremes, even in positive activities. He reminds that salad is good for you, but if you only ever ate salad, your body would be missing out on vital nutrients from other foods. Similarly, if all we ever do is study with no breaks or other activities we enjoy, we are headed to bur for burnout. Now, truth be known, it is difficult to balance these domains every single day. There will be times when we need to focus on one domain at the exclusion of the other, such as during finals week when we are highly focused on the intellectual domain, or during the Sabbath when we have more church obligations, or during a challenging time in the family when we're focused on the social and the emotional. Our goal should be to seek balance over the long haul. As a whole person opportunity, being wellness-wise means we focus on the quest for perfection rather than on perfection itself. It also means we focus on balance and growth in each of the wellness-wise domain areas. As we become wellness-wise by embracing wellness as a whole person opportunity, we will not only be capable of meeting personal challenge and change, but we'll also bring strength to others in the task of home and family life, social relationships and civic, civic duty, and service to mankind. 
Meeting personal challenge and change speaks to our ability to be resilient when faced with some of the crap that will surely come our way in life. And bringing strength to others speaks to our becoming self-actualized, becoming our best self, achieving optimal mental health, and even flourishing. Now, finally, being wellness-wise not only recognizes wellness as a whole person opportunity, but also as a whole campus responsibility. Because we know something about the powerful influence that our context can have on us individually, it means that as an institution, we will focus on a system-wide approach to influence the conditions in which all may achieve, might achieve, optimal mental health and flourish. Consider the part of the BYU mission that references all instruction programs and services, including a wide variety of extracurricular experiences, should make their own contribution towards the balanced development of the total person. This means that no faculty member, staff member, administrator, or even student is excluded from the responsibility of assisting individuals in their balanced development. Taking this responsibility seriously, a group of BYU staff, administrators, faculty, and students have joined together under the leadership of former CAPS director Dr. Steve Smith and student life vice president Julie Franklin. Known as the BYU Wellness Wise Coalition, this group exists to break down campus silos and cultivate campus-wide collaborations and initiatives that advance wellness for all community members. Now, the word silo is commonly used on farms to describe those large storage containers for grain and cattle food. In public health and health care, the term silo is often used as a metaphor for teams of people that just don't work together. The BYU Wellness Wise Coalition exists to help ensure that we are a whole campus and collaborate to advance wellness for all. Exciting, isn't it? We have such wonderful opportunities and responsibilities before us. It's time for us to say something and know something more about mental health so that we can be something more and achieve optimal mental health. Saying something more can help us reduce the mental health stigma and realize that optimal mental health and flourishing is accessible to everyone. Knowing something more can help us understand the risk and protective factors for mental health challenges that can be addressed both personally and institutionally. Being something more by being wellness-wise both personally and institutionally provides a framework for taking the actions that will move us all towards optimal mental health. Saying something, knowing something, and being something more. That's something about mental health. Thank you.